guys, it's Emma and I'm back today for you with another video and today we're doing something a little bit different. Today I am reviewing Roadhouse 2024. Okay, so the reimagining of the 1989 cult classic. I love Roadhouse. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. So when I heard that they were making a, a reimagining, a reboot, remake, whatever of Roadhouse, I was like, okay, no, I might just have to watch that. Um, and <laughs> lo and behold, I have some opinions, comments, criticisms, everything under the sun. This is going to be me going through the movie, hopefully in somewhat of chronological order, just to make it somewhat sensical, but this is going to be me going through the movie and reviewing it. Okay. So, uh, right off the bat, this is going to be spoilery. Okay. So if you haven't watched this movie and you still want to watch it, I wouldn't recommend watching this video. I'm sure as you can tell from the title above, this is going to be a negative review, overall negative review. All right. I'm going to pick this movie the fuck apart. Uh, therefore, all of these opinions are my own. Movie viewing is subjective. R opinions are subjective. This is simply just me bitching about why I think this movie sucks. <laughs> okay, so um, before we actually start, I would really, really appreciate it if you guys look down in the description box for all the links there that I have about stuff going on in the world right now. For example, what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in Myanmar, what's going on in Haiti, what's going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, everything of the sort, right? So those links will be down there for you guys to look at, to interact with and to share. And then down in the comment section, let me know whether or not you guys like the original Roadhouse, whether you've seen this Roadhouse that we're going to be talking about, whether you like this Roadhouse, what y'all's favorite 80s 90s action movie was get creative okay so with that being said let's just get right on into it so the movie opens up um with us essentially in this uh underground fight club and post malone is now on the screen all right um and you know he's fighting and this is when we see frankie come in and be like hey i'm looking for carter ford carter ford being Post Malone's character. And um, she, you know, is kind of impressed, obviously, because Post Malone is decking the shit out of people, right? And meanwhile, all of this is going on, you know, we're gearing up, we see Jake Gyllenhaal come out of the car. Um, and, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal is Dalton. Meanwhile, all of this is going on, all right? Um, we hear Post Malone's song, I think it's called Horsepower. And let me just say something right here, right now. Spotify, count your fucking days, okay? Because the fact that you didn't put one of the best, if not the best thing to come out of this movie on your app, sleep with one eye open bitch with this playing i'm expecting oh okay blues rock country rock type of thing because at least in the original roadhouse um most of the music was either rock or blues rock and i really enjoyed that obviously um and obviously horsepower just fit the bill dalton comes in and essentially like scams everybody because he's like, oh my gosh, no, I'm gonna fight this dude. I'm unlacing my boots. Post Malone's character realizes who the hell Jake Gyllenhaal's character is and is like, okay, no, I'm not fighting this dude. Uh, he can take all the money. I'm out. And so Dalton, Jake Gyllenhaal's character, essentially takes the money without even having to throw a single swing, right? So he's going outside and then Frankie comes out and is like, hey, you know, I'm looking for somebody to come up and clean up my bar, right? Um, and the bar is called the roadhouse. So she asks him, hey, will you come up and clean up my bar and I'll hire you since you know you're like famous in the MMA world because in this version of Roadhouse, Dalton is an ex-MMA fighter. He initially rejects her and then he's sleeping in his car and then he like calls her up and is like, yeah, no, I accept. Um, this is, I think, where the first inconsistency comes from, at least for me, okay, because further on down the line, all right, we realize that Dalton is an ex-MMA fighter, of course, and the reason why he's so scared of fighting is because one time in the ring, uh, he and this dude were duking it out, and he essentially got so scared that instinct took over, he saw red, and he essentially pummeled the other dude to the point where the other dude died in the ring. Obviously that sets up a really good backstory. There's this dude, Jay Gyllenhaal, Dalton, who is a very good fighter, but doesn't want to use his full strength in case he kills somebody again. Very good backstory, right? So why does he take the job as a bouncer? Don't get me wrong, I know a bouncer isn't like a bodyguard, you know what I mean? But especially in terms of what Frankie hires him for, I need you to come and clean up my bar as a bouncer. 
So you'd assume that, oh, okay, he's going to be duking bitches out. So if he's afraid to duke bitches out and kill them, why is he taking a job to duke bitches out? That just doesn't make any sense to me. He gets down to the Florida Keys because that's where the roadhouse is. And um, he essentially stops at this little bookstore and meets Charlie and her father. Charlie, at least for me, is one of, if not the first instance where the dialogue in this movie is piss poor. I think this movie is trying at points to break the fourth wall and kind of be like, oh yeah, you know, in a typical action movie, this, this, and this would happen. You know what I mean? But they actually say it in the dialogue. Like at one point, uh, Charlie is like, oh yeah, no. So sh she's like mentioning Westerns. That kind of sounds like the plot to a Western. Like local townsfolk send for a hero to help clean up the rowdy saloon. Not only that instance, but we have a bunch of other instances specifically with Charlie's character where they try to be like, okay, well, yeah, no, at this point in the Western, this will be a mystery Western. Or at the very end, she and uh, Dalton have like this conversation about Dalton, quote unquote, not being the hero of the story. I don't think I'm the hero in this particular story, Charlie. So maybe you're not the hero. You ain't the villain either. We get it, bruh. We get it. The metaphor is, it's not subtle enough anymore. It's being shoved in our faces, okay? Which, I like me a good satire, all right, of a specific genre, all right? One movie that I think did pretty well with that is In a Valley of Violence. Uh, which is essentially a satire on spaghetti westerns. It wasn't shoved in our faces. We got to sit back and be like, oh yeah, no, that's funny type thing. You know what I mean? So I don't know if Roadhouse was trying to do that because I know this was a reimagining. However, I think that if this movie was in fact trying to be satirical in some points by jabbing at action movies, it was way too obvious. It's too in your face. It's too heavy handed. The satire doesn't have any emphasis anymore. Then Dalton gets to the Roadhouse <laughs> and uh, he, you know, acquaints himself with the bartender, two of the, I guess, mini bouncers that are already there um and you know now they're n now we're essentially waiting for okay what's the chaos look like right um so the that night one of the bar fights breaks out um and it's literally just two dudes um at once and you know we see the band obviously and it's behind the infamous chicken wire and yet this is another inconsistency why is the chicken wire only in the front you know what i mean there's no chicken wire on the side. There's no chicken wire on this side. And so there's just chicken wire up here. What is stopping people from throwing the bottles around the chicken wire? As for like the bar fights themselves, um, I'm very confused <laughs> as to why Frankie needed Dalton because we learn later on that, you know, there's been three other bouncers before him that essentially called it quits because they were like, the job is too tough. One of them being an ex like Marine or whatever. The bar fights in Roadhouse, we literally hear Tillman say, oh yeah, no, um, my, my bar has essentially become known as the place where people scrape up the eyeballs after closing, right? The first bar fight that we see is a huge bar brawl with like 20 people in it. All right, and more, and tables are being broken, and glasses are being broken, and people are being cut out. Like, it's it's chaos, all right? Which, you know, obviously that's why they hire Patrick Swayze. In this movie, Frankie going for an ex-MMA fighter, right? Someone who has as notorious a reputation as Dalton in this movie does, you'd think, oh, okay, no. I'm expecting, like, brawls every night. You know what I mean? Like, seriousness equating to the need of an ex-MMA fighter to come in and shape everything up. Most of the bar fights, if anything, are just spats. They, at the most, include three people. And it's only ever one right after the other. So there's not the chaos of multiple one-on-one -on -one person fights going on. That would make sense. No, there's literally just one fight between two people, they throw them out. One fight between two people, throw them out, at the most. What were the credentials of the other three dudes before Dalton? And you're telling me the Navy SEAL can- I- I was like- So that was another inconsistency. I'm like, that just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Like, don't get me wrong, you're still losing money. 
and you're still having a fight every night in your bar, but it's not like brawls. We're not having rumbles in your bar. And this same night is the night where we see the first instance of the underlings to the big bad, right? How, you know, we saw uh, Brad Wesley's boys come in and, you know, try and stir shit up, right? This is like the first instance that we get of 2024's version of Brad Wesley. Right. Um, and all I have to say is I know this is like obviously due to like weather and costuming, but I really cannot take seriously these guys that come in and are like, oh, yeah, no, we're big and hard and we're just we're here to kill you. And y'all are in Hawaiian shirts, polo shirts and knee length jean shorts. <laughs> Sorry, you. you then obviously, you know, we get the thing of Dalton taking them outside. This fight scene, I think, is the best fight scene out of the whole movie, okay? Because um, we get more insight into Dalton's character um, because he essentially beats all of these dudes by slapping them with, like, open-handed slaps. So it introduces kind of a layer of, oh, okay, no, something happened with this dude that makes him not want to use his full power. So while I loved that, um, this fight I think was the first instance where I was like, okay, wait a minute, no, there's something weird about these punches. Every single time that Dalton gets into a fight or just that anybody gets punched at all, the punches don't look real, okay? And yes, I get it, Emma, it's a movie. It's a movie about fighting. Well, you're telling me that you make a movie about fighting and you can't even make the punches look realistic? Are you kidding me? The punches look so badly edited, it's not even funny, okay? And the only way that I really know how to describe it is like essentially the, you've got like the more realistic fluidity and I guess time frame of the punch coming in and then as soon as the punch hits somebody in the face, I don't know how to really articulate this, but it looks like the punch speeds up like half a millisecond and then just goes back to normal, like fluidity moving past the face. And this brings me into the usage of camera angles with this movie, okay, especially with the fight scenes, um, because either the camera angles are like really like mobile and going all around the action in order to either hide the unrealistic looking punches or the camera angles are shown in an instance where obviously they're filming behind the person that's punching right so that the punch you don't see it collide with the fist or the lack thereof right therefore it looks more realistic they would film it like that up until maybe the fist is like right next to the face and then they would switch it to show like to zoom in on the punch not hitting the face so it, it, it they shoot themselves in the foot and especially in the slap fight the um there's one punch where it doesn't even look like they even tried to edit it out it looks like they cut it like a millisecond of a frame to where the fist is right here and then all of a sudden it cuts and the fist is right here. And all of a sudden the dude is on the ground. Not to mention, most of these impacts are not realistic in the slightest, all right? Somebody backhanding you is not gonna send you five feet across the room, all right? That's just not realistic. That's not what happens. I remember thinking to myself, it looks like a video game at some points, which isn't bad. It, mm, in an action movie, <laughs> okay, where you have specific climactic points of action. When your action sequences don't at least look somewhat realistic, or if your action sequences are so obviously flawed in either one or many ways, it takes your audience out of immersion, which I don't know about y'all, I would think that the first thing that movie makers are trying to do is keep the audience as immersed as possible. However, when your punches look so badly edited that even somebody who doesn't know about editing could tell, that's when it's a little embarrassing, all right? Especially because I was watching the credits, right? I was trying to get my thoughts together and I saw the producer's name and it's Joel Silver, all right? And for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> 
Joel Silver is an iconic producer who has had a hand in producing not only the original 1989 Roadhouse, he's had um, a hand in producing Lethal Weapon, all right, Die Hards 1 and 2, Predator, a bunch of the other Predator movies, all right, you're telling me that as somebody who is, who has had a hand in making and creating and producing, all right, some of the most iconic 80s and 90s action movies that there are you can't even make sure that the editing looks somewhat realistic so essentially you know we get this whole thing of dalton being the guy that beats the dudes up and then drives them to the hospital later this is where we meet the nurse all right ellie because she's like oh my gosh you're bleeding um you need to get in my er right and uh so you know they're sitting there and this is where i think you know they're gonna have like the iconic pain don't hurt or at least like another like really cool I don't know nod to the original right which they do I'll give a credit for that um they have the iconic line no one ever wins a fight the movie goes along you know what I mean Dalton goes back to the roadhouse he like sleeps on the boat so you know instead of a barn it's a boat and he goes back to the bookshop in order to talk to Charlie and I gotta say this is where the dialogue really just gets cringy from maybe like the first 20 minutes of this movie up until now and honestly the rest of the movie afterwards this movie to me just has such an awkward feeling about it and i can't even necessarily tell you why all i can tell you really is that it's not helped whatsoever by this dialogue while dalton is at the bookstore right uh some of the goons come in and you know rob uh one of the stores next to charlie's bookshop and she goes out with a bat and you know in order to like wave him off or whatever she's sitting outside dalton comes out and is like oh my gosh i'm sorry that you have to deal with this she's like eh, it's all right yada 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 and um sh she she calls them a-holes right which you know okay she's she looks like 15 16 whatever whatever and then she's like yeah no shit happens why would she say shit but not assholes. What's with the inconsistency in the dialogue? This is now where we meet the big bad, all right? 2024's version of Brad Wesley. And it's Billy Magnuson's character. And all I have to say is throughout this movie, Billy Magnuson's character, like all the other villains, is not scary or intimidating whatsoever, all right? At the most, it's hilarious. At this point, I really gotta give the actors credit, all right, for saying these lines because bitch, I could never, okay? Um, because we have Billy Magnuson over here calling his goons to their faces dum-dums. Looking back for the first time that I watched this, um, we get like little bits and pieces of Billy Magnuson being terrified of his dad, right? Because apparently we learn in the, we, we learn from the rest of the movie that Billy Magnuson's dad like got in trouble with, some sort of crime or whatever and he's doing time right billy magnuson's character brant his dad plays kind of like this threatening presence like every single time that brant messes up his dad gives him a call and is like hey son you need to fix this whatever whatever however many times that needs to happen with all of those different times that brant's dad calls in i'm thinking to myself okay no they're setting us up for a reveal they're setting us up for, like for a reveal of this big threatening presence and he's gonna come in and be terrifying we don't ever meet Brant's dad. So all those phone calls, what was the point? I think this movie was either trying to make Billy Magnuson's character have layers, which I don't really know how many layers this dude's gonna have other than being scared and pathetic. Um, or they were trying to set up for like this weird mystery, which I guess they just didn't follow through on. Why would we give a shit about one Billy Magnuson's dad and why would we give a shit, too, about Billy Magnuson's villain as a character at all if most of his motivation is hinging on the threatening presence of his dad? Which, the threatening presence of his dad as a character was even more intriguing than, than any of the other villains in this whole damn movie. Then we get back to the roadhouse and we see Jake Gyllenhaal's Dalton essentially training like the other two bouncers that are there. And, you know, it ends up being like this cute little montage of like them training. And I'm gonna say right here and right now that Dalton, other than the slap fight, doesn't actually fight anybody until maybe the hour 15 minute mark. This movie is two hours and three minutes long. Everything I'm here, I just wanna clarify a little bit. Yes, 
he has spats like every now and then throughout the movie, but there's only like what? A handful of them and they last about maybe three seconds each. Okay, in my opinion, there is most definitely a difference between Dalton having a spat with somebody versus Dalton having a fight with somebody. Now we get to the point in the movie, it's about like what, the 43 minute mark. And um, this is when we have the infamous Pearl conversation between Ellie and Dalton, all right? They meet like at a restaurant or whatever, outside the hospital, they talk, whatever. And um, then they start talking about the pearls um, in the Florida Keys, whatever, whatever, and how conch shells produce pearls. And that even though pearls are beautiful, you know, it's awful for the conch shell because the way to create a pearl is like an irritant gets in and that's how the pearl is created and then this line extreme irritation and leads to something beautiful ah <laughs> like like not even that line it's just the entire conversation is so wooden you know it's like am i watching two people have this conversation or or or, or am i watching like two deck chairs talk to one another. Now we get to like the next point of contention that I have with this fucking movie. All right, um, and that's the plot armor. After another night at the roadhouse, Dalton's walking home, he's walking along a bridge, whatever, whatever. And obviously we see a car like stalking him in the background and then the car speeds up and uh, Dalton dodges it, but then the car backs up and essentially hits Dalton in the legs to where Dalton is flipped onto like the bed of the truck. And I'm thinking to myself, his legs would be fucked up. So miraculously, when the car falls into the water off the bridge with Dalton into the water, um, Dalton can still swim because he has plaintive use of his legs. This man might as well be superhuman. We've gotten like 50 minutes of the way into the movie and Dalton's character, just like Dalton's mannerisms are altogether very different, I would say, from the original Dalton in 1989, which I don't really have a problem with. I don't really have a problem that they made Dalton more goofy, more talkative. I feel like it works a little bit more, weirdly enough. Um, the only problem that I have with Dalton's character in and of itself is the nonsensical backstory of him being an MMA fighter, which now he's scared to ever fight fully again, and yet he's taken the job as a bouncer. Now we get to the man of the hour, Conor McGregor, that's in this movie. All right, Conor McGregor is introduced as kind of this maniacal, I guess, mercenary for hire. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, for the entirety of this movie that Conor McGregor was not in, I forgot that he was even in the movie, which I find hilarious personally, okay? Because Champ Champ is the funniest dude in the movie, okay? Champ Champ has the most jokes. Um, and it's compounded by the fact that the dialogue, just in general, is cringy as hell, all right? Um, that they're trying so hard to, like, break the fourth wall. And so after we meet Conor McGregor, now it's time for a little bit more romance, all right? Because we remember how in 1989's Roadhouse, Dalton falls in love with the nurse. And in this uh, 2024 version, Dalton also falls in love with the nurse. Um, which, I'm not gonna lie... I really couldn't care less about their romance, all right? And that is because of a few things. One, there's not enough time throughout this whole movie paid attention to their romance, okay? Because at this point, when Ellie takes Dalton to go essentially sunbathe on like a sandbar or whatever, they kiss, right? And um, they kiss once throughout the whole movie. I think they interact maybe like two other times and neither of those times were romantically. It's poor writing. The other reason is simply personal, okay? Um, listen, Daniela Melchior, the actress who played Ellie, she has a baby face, okay? Jake Gyllenhaal does not. It's just very awkward looking. And this was my exact same criticism with Divergent, all right? They cast Shailene Woodley, who looks 16 in the movie, all right? She has a baby face. Theo James does not have a baby face. He looks like a grown ass man. All right, so for this 16 year old looking woman and this grown ass looking man to be kissing and making out, it's weird. It looks weird. It's the same, it's the same sentiment that I have in this movie, all right? Someone who looks about 18 years old kissing this grown ass looking man. It just looks so strange. Uh, and I honestly think that this movie could have been better had they just not done a romance between the two of them. 
all right? Because then honestly, the rest of the movie and its lack of romantic tension between Dalton and Ellie would have made sense. This is when Conor McGregor gets to Billy Magnuson's character and then they meet and then Billy Magnuson's character, Brant, um, is like, okay, no, you're a maniac. Um, give me at least a chance to work it out because um, it's, it's my business. My daddy wants me to inherit the Florida Keys. I want a racing team daddy. Conor McGregor is like, okay, sure, do what you want, baby doll. I'm gonna chill and drink all your alcohol. And so Dalton gets picked up by the cops, which throughout time and time again, this movie, we've been told that the cops are bad. The cops are bad. The cops aren't trustworthy. The cops are bad. The cops aren't trustworthy. The cops are being on like somebody else's payroll. We get it. Okay, we get it. You don't trust cops anyway, but all right. So Jake Gyllenhaal's sitting in the back of this cop car and then another dude, the sheriff, gets in the front seat. And I'm I'm listening to his voice. And I'm hearing and I'm like, is that Joaquin de Almeida? Is that Mr. Queen of the South? Is that Mr. Desperado? And soon enough, obviously we see his face and I'm like, that is. I'm like, okay, no, this could actually be cool because Joaquin de Almeida plays an awesome villain. And then he goes and says his name. Yeah, my name is Big Dick. <laughs> no, no. Big Dick. So if they introduce a female villain, what's her name gonna be? Small Clit? Which is another reason why I think, oh, okay, is this supposed to be like a satirical, you know, poke at, um, 80s, 90s action movies, like having like really machismo villains, you know, which if that's the case, holy shit, dude. As Chandler Bing would say, can you get more in my face? So now we make it to the hour and 12 minute mark. Um, and all right, <clears throat> Billy Magnuson's Brant comes in to reason with Dalton and is like, yeah, no, you should leave because I want the roadhouse. He tries to essentially like, poke Dalton a lot by essentially showing him the video of Dalton's MMA fight that we learn got him terrified of ever fighting again. And Dalton just doesn't reciprocate. Brant is like, oh, okay, fine. He kind of he, he kind of pouts a little bit, kind of throws a mini little psychological tantrum, goes outside, tells Connor, okay, yeah, no, burn the bitch down. And uh, Connor McGregor, whose character's name is Knox, comes in with a golf club. <clears throat> like really you couldn't have given this man a crowbar don't get me wrong i'm not saying that you can't do serious damage with a golf club but you coming into a bar as conor mcgregor swinging a golf club let's just say it doesn't exactly inspire intimidation girlfriend okay but um this point the hour 15 12 12 15 minute mark all right this is where we finally see a big bar brawl. So we have this bar fight and, um, uh, you know, Knox and Dalton are going at it, you know, showing off that they are the two principal fighters here. Meanwhile, obviously the band is still playing. The band that they have play at this moment in time during the bar fight. The bar fight hasn't even started yet. And I'm all, that was violence. Somebody please come get their dad. He's drunk on a stage playing a guitar and making like he's eating box. Now, for the rest of this bar fight, all right, we see Dalton collectively get his ass whooped. Again, just shitty editing for the punches, all right? There are some punches where it's literally like, you can tell that they're trying to use the camera uh, movement to cover up the punches being landed and it's just so fake. It's so obvious. The fight, it was long awaited because like I said, this movie, like I keep saying, okay, take a shot every single time I mention that this fucking movie is two hours and three minutes long, all right? Because this movie is two hours and three minutes long and this, this fight, all right, this bar rumble finally happens at the one hour and 15 minute mark. And that's when at least it feels to me that the director team was like, oh my gosh, wait a minute, no, this movie's about fighting. We have to put in as much fighting as we can. Girl, and it shows. 
badly. So yada yada yada, um, movie goes on, exposition we get, lore we're given, you know, this is when we find out and get more details into why Dalton uh, doesn't like to fight, but um, all of a sudden he's like, okay, yeah, no, I'm actually gonna swing on bitches. It would have made sense had his character had a more gradual swing. That's not how that happens in the movie. It's kind of just like, okay, no, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be a bouncer. Um, I don't want to hit people because I'm afraid I'm gonna hurt somebody. And then one thing happens that just suddenly pushes him so over the edge that he's like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no, I'm gonna go full on MMA fighter on these people. That doesn't make any sense, all right? It's too jarring, it happens too quick. There's a reason why people um, say that the Clone Wars, the animated series, the Clone Wars should have been like more pushed to be more canonized um, and put in between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith to make Anakin's fall more realistic. The fall, I guess, that Jake Gyllenhaal takes um, from being little Mr. Goody Two Shoes to being Mr. Shawn Michaels doling out sweet chin music to everybody in the vicinity happens so fast and it's jarring. It doesn't make any damn sense. The logistics in this movie are nowhere to be seen. So Dalton like takes some money from Brant because sure and then big dick <laughs> makes an appearance um and we had learned like prior that sheriff dick and ellie are father and daughter and this is when we learned that ellie has been kidnapped kidnapped off screen okay to use his leverage so that dalton will come and bring the money back because um after one kiss and zero other romantic scenes between each other. We're supposed to give a shit about this romance. Being like, okay, no, we have to get them back together because we love them so much. Who? Are they in the room with us? Also, not to mention, because her kidnapping happens off screen, we're supposed to care about that. This supposedly climactic plot point that magically happens, it's just plopped in there all of a sudden. And it's like, oh wait, yeah, no, by the way, Ellie's been kidnapped. We need you to come and bring the dough to us. Thank you for letting us know, I guess, before you just showed Ellie just somehow in Brant's yacht. Like, what? It doesn't make sense logistically, cinematically, via emotional stakes. It doesn't make sense. So uh, Dalton goes over to Brant's yacht and blows it up and, you know, saves Ellie. They're in the water swimming around, whatever, whatever. And this is when Conor McGregor comes speeding up on a speedboat, you know, trying to run over Dalton in the water. Ellie is dragged onto another boat by Brant um, and he speeds off towards the roadhouse. So Dalton is essentially left in the water, duking bitches out water polo style um, and has to, you know, dodge Conor McGregor in order to not get uh, destroyed by what I would assume to be a propeller. This part where Jake Gyllenhaal climbs into the boat with Conor McGregor and Conor McGregor says this. Our own little octagon. And then Jake Gyllenhaal replies with this. What? Who taught you shapes? So do you want to leave or should I? I'll leave. I'll do it. Since, you know, we just don't give a fuck about metaphors anymore, right? Good to know. Since we're just tossing metaphors out the window or really we're just squashing them down so flat that they're not even metaphors. And okay, good. I'm, I'm just glad we're both on the same page. And I'm so glad you and I had this conversation. I've talked about how I despise forced funny. I despise it. It's not funny when it's so obviously forced, Beb. And in this specific instance, it ruins a good metaphor. It would have been a nice um, existential thing where it's like, oh my gosh, no, Jake Gyllenhaal's Dalton finally has to, you know, face his fear or whatever, whatever. But no, we're just gonna squash it with a dumbass one-liner. This is where it really gets gritty. All right, you want another instance of plot armor in this movie? Yeah? All right, so, um, the boat that Brant and Ellie are on, right? Brant is steering it and he's like, okay, no, I'm gonna take out two birds with one stone. I'm gonna get rid of both Dalton and Knox. And so he starts steering his boat um, to essentially meet head on with uh, Dalton and Knox's boat. Knox has been driven over the side and he's uh, hanging on for dear life. And so Dalton is driving this boat and obviously it kind of veers to the side a little bit to where the impact only hits the side, but the impact of these boats hitting, get this, causes Dalton to flip over the, so like over the top hit the ceiling, magically land on top of the ceiling, 
roll over, and then fall in the back of the boat completely unharmed. This dude has more plot armor than Indiana Jones. All right, this man, I believe, could fully survive a nuclear bomb. And then, you know, we have the titular battle or whatever, you know, Billy Magnuson's villain and Dalton duke it out. Billy Magnuson gets beat the hell up. And then it's Dalton and Knox together. And this is where, you know, they have that like really climactic fight between the two of them. The punches are so badly edited once again. It's it, it's never ending. I did have a little uh, guffaw with the little piano thing. The highlight of the fight was with the sticks. All right, when Dalton stabs um, him like over and over in very quick and very fluid succession, by the way. So I thought that was really well done. I thought it was such a letdown that Rina Sawayama's uh, cover of um, Enter Sandman was only played like maybe for what 10 seconds at the most and it wasn't even her singing It was just the entrance to Enter Sandman. So why didn't you just use the original Enter Sandman? So I'm like, so yeah, Dalton wins the fight um, Ellie comes over sees him just Dripping in blood and gore obviously because the man literally just fought for his life and uh, Then big dick shows up. He's like, oh my gosh, my daughter's safe. Dalton you need to scram uh, you were never here. So Dalton leaves and he's waiting at the Greyhound stop and that's when Charlie comes up and um, that's when they have, like I said much earlier, uh, that little conversation where they were like, well Dalton, maybe, maybe you're not the hero of the story. You ain't the villain either. That's how Roadhouse ends. All of that being said, okay, I did not enjoy this movie in the slightest. I thought it had such promise in the beginning, but unfortunately, like the blues country rock motif that they had going on in the first 15 minutes, uh, the potential just disappeared for me personally. This would be, I think, the second Billy Magnuson movie that unfortunately I have not liked. Okay, um, I've seen him in Into the Woods, loved that. Um, Enter the Dragon was a shit show. If you'd like to see a uh, video about Enter the Dragon, Please let me know. I hope that if you guys watch this movie, you enjoy it. Um, you guys have a better time than I did, okay? Um, I know obviously not everybody's gonna feel this way. Obviously not all 1989 Roadhouse fans are gonna feel this way. Unfortunately, they just don't compare, in my humble opinion. Okay, you guys? So with that being said, I hope that you've enjoyed. I hope that you'll continue to look out for more stuff on my channel. I hope that you guys are staying safe. And lastly, I hope that you guys have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.